first off, just want to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, like for those of you guys that are new, uh, there's a, a long line of NYO football history here. The uh, park has been here for 70 years, and football was our first sport. So there's a long line of trophies and history, but I think like more importantly, it's, it's a long line of fun and just teaching the game the right way. Um, there's a lot of speakers here today. It's kind of one more extension to what we're doing over the, the, the like last few years, just to focus on player safety and to make sure that we help uh, just educate families and their parents on like all the different layers to play in football, but also just here at NYO. And we're super fortunate to have people that are gonna um, like just talk here, but, uh, like today with you guys, but also be resources like throughout the course of the year, like if you guys have questions. Um, but first off, I want to just introduce a couple people so you guys know who makes all of this happen. Um, first off, John Baker, who's our football commissioner. Uh, John's been here for more years than he wants me to like, acknowledge, so I'll leave that off. But John's been a long-term volunteer. Um, he's, he's helped make like, NYO football what it is today. And if you've gotten one of the thousands of emails from football at NYO Sports, or if you ever have to reach out, he's the guy that has to manage that account along with his day job as well. Um, a new commissioner on the football side is Russell Harrell, who handles all the flag football. So if you have a child that's in kindergarten through second grade, um, the second grade is new for us the last few years, and then K through one, I guess going on about, what, five or six years now? Uh, but that program is obviously thriving. There's over 200 kids in flag football. Um, and like Russell's the one that has to deal with all the coaches that wants to form a dream team in, in kindergarten, first and second grade, but helps keep everybody organized. Um, and then Miss Connie Lamb, who's our football ox chair. If you're a team parent, if you're looking to get involved as a volunteer, um, she's the one that helps us out from anything from you know, tailgating to uniforms to um, just keeping all of our coaches organized as the season starts with team parents. Uh, like we're also like super lucky to have a coaches development program, and like Jim Easterling is like in charge of that, and he'll speak here for a little bit. But that's uh, in terms of character development, and you'll hear more about that later. But just having guest speakers, those players that have come through NYO and talk about their experience. Uh, but also just for the NYO players to kind of know that there's more to this program than just football and learn what it means, the life skills that go into it. Um, but a big part of today is hearing from some medical professionals uh, on player safety and letting you guys ask them some questions. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Darby, who's our athletic trainer from CHOA. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Darby. I am an athletic trainer at Children's Healthcare. So my job is I specifically work with club sports athletes anywhere from elementary, middle, and high school. Um, I am actually out here once a week for all of you and your children. I come out on Wednesdays normally from about 6 to 8. Um, I am here to do any kind of injury checks you guys want. Your kids complain about ankle pain, knee pain. He has an ankle sprain that's not healing. You know, she's got some knee stuff going on. Come out and see me. Um, I'm going to leave my business cards here, that way you all have my cell phone number, you got my email. Call me, text me, email me, let me know. Um, and we're going to kind of go over some injuries today. But, you know, I just want to let you know I'm here. I'm here every Wednesday. Normally I hang out by the football fields. I'll be walking around with my fanny pack on, um, or a sling pack. You can tap me on the shoulder, you know, just let me know what's going on. If you have questions, anything, I'm here. And also help get you in to see children's doctors normally next day. So instead of waiting for the extended waiting list for a lot of our doctors, um, I can normally slide you right on and I can reach out to them. Um, specifically today what I'm talking to you guys about is heat illness. You know, it's super hot out there. We all know it. We try to avoid getting outside during the afternoon at all. Um, I'm going to kind of go through some of the things we need to look out for, things to you know, prepare with, all that kind of stuff. All right. So to start off, um, there are actually three different forms of heat-related illnesses in children. Um, you've got dehydration and heat cramps is your first stage. You've got heat exhaustion and heat stroke. So obviously, you know, dehydration and heat cramps is going to be your lowest level of heat illness. Starts off, you know, a little bit of dizziness, a little bit of fatigue, muscle cramping, that kind of stuff. We've all seen it. We've all experienced it. Um, when this happens, you can normally take breaks, 
sit in the shade, rehydrate, you know, stretch out if you're cramping, and then as soon as symptoms are resolved, you're able to go back to play. Now, to avoid this and any and all heat illnesses, it's super important to keep your children hydrated all day long. Hydration starts at home, not at practice. If they're drinking water all day, it does help prevent all these heat illnesses from happening. Now, when they're at practice, we do recommend they drink things like Gatorade and Powerade to help replenish those electrolytes. Um, water sometimes doesn't do quite enough when they're sweating out all of those salts. Now, the next level is heat exhaustion. Now, this is going to be a little bit more intense, a little bit more serious. Um, it can have a rapid pulse, headache, nausea, vomiting, chills, loss of coordination, excessive sweating, and dry skin. Now with this, you're going to want to stop play immediately and start drinking water or a sports drink. It's incredibly important to tell your children that when they're hot, they need to drink their water and not pour it on their head. I know it feels great, but it is not doing nearly as much for them as if they can drink it. Um, now if this happens where they start getting you know, the rapid pulse and loss of coordination, they're sweating in buckets, um, it's super important to get them into the pool facility. You know, we have the coaches who can for this, so you guys aren't always at practice. We know this, but it's important to also tell your children when they're feeling these things to speak up. You know, they're the biggest advocate out here. Their coaches can only do so much. It's super, super important for you guys to let them know these things too. Um, at this point, if you're unable to, you know, kind of get that temperature regulated, if it stop sweating, stop overheating, you would need to go to the hospital. Now, past this, you have heat stroke. Um, this is the most serious heat illness. It does come with vomiting and dangerous and high temperatures. Um, this is the point at which you submerge in a cold tub, use ice packs to get cold and transport and eat us. Obviously, we're hoping this doesn't happen at all, but it is something to be aware of and keep your eye out for. Um, coaches are aware, you know, keep the kids hydrated, they're giving them good water breaks. You, know, you guys had that awesome week last week and climatizing back into this. You know, it has been hot out. Um, so definitely make sure you're you know, really, really talking to your kids about staying hydrated all day long, drinking their water, you know, staying cool and speaking up when they get too hot. Okay? It's very important. The coaches can't watch every single day. Not as much as they love to, I'm sure. Um, so definitely, too, um, what's really important for like, uh, staying hydrated is thirst isn't always a great indicator of if you're dehydrated. What we say is we want the kids to drink until they aren't thirsty anymore before practice and then have them drink another eight ounces of water. It's just a really good practice to get into to make sure that they have enough water in them to keep their body temperatures cool and regulated. Right. And we definitely recommend staying away from fruit juice and soda and caffeine and that the hydrates are faster, all those sugars are very bad. Moving on to just under touch briefly on overuse.
sort things out and kind of help you with that. Um, but, uh, and then the other thing as far as like staying hydrated, I like to give like a little tip, like the, 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 the being hydrated before they come out is really important. Because if they come out already dehydrated, they're going to only get worse from there. So, um, one or two glasses, 30 minutes of, of water, 30 minutes before practice or game, uh, and then try to have a good 32 ounces of fluid available for, for every hour or hour and a half of practice or game you might have uh, during. So at least they have the availability to get it. But uh, the main thing I'm going to talk about today is concussions, uh, which comes up with football, unfortunately. Uh, concussions um, are a brain injury. It's a functional brain injury. Uh, it can be caused by any direct blow to the head, but it can also be caused by a whiplash kind of mechanism. Because basically what happens is the brain rattles around inside the skull and it bounces up along the inside part of the skull and the injured area undergoes some metabolic changes. Uh, those metabolic changes kind of slow down the functioning of the brain. So the brain cells can't talk to each other as effectively as they're supposed to and that can lead to a variety of symptoms. Thank you. 
to see a doctor. This isn't one that, oh, they see, like, we thought they had a concussion, they were a little bit off that night, uh, but then the next couple of nights they weren't so bad, so I'll just let them go back. This is one that really is important that um, we're 100% certain that it's fully healed, and then we go through the right kind of gradual progression back uh, before they're back out in the contact situation. Uh, the other thing we know about concussions are you might start feeling good at rest, but as soon as you have to kind of start using your brain to do cognitive stuff like in school, or even get your heart rate up, get your physical exertion up, a lot of those symptoms come from treatment back in if they're not fully resolved. So there's a number of things as doctors that we're looking for and we're looking to see the improve before we put it back into a risky situation. Um, and uh, finally, that doctor's clearance is um, uh, what's most, most important. And, and typically, you know, if someone has a concussion, we're going to put them through a, that progression where first thing, you know, they, they may be cleared at rest from everything, but they're going to do some jogging, and then the next day they may do some harder sprinting, uh, they may be able to do some weight training if they're doing weight training at this age, uh, and then they're going to do a non-contact practice, and they're going to do a full practice before they're back in any, any kind of game situation. So, the other thing that I want to point out is I'm from Children's Hospital. Children's has a lot of good information about just pediatric sports medicine and sports injuries in general, but they have a lot of good information about concussions. Uh, and on the handouts, if you saw one, uh, at the bottom of uh, the webpage, the choa.org and slash concussions, or if you just go to the main page and put concussions in the search bar, you're going to find all that information. There's also a phone number on there to get in touch with someone in Children's for scheduling. Call that phone number, the one that ends in kids, and ask for the concussion nurse. There's an advice line with the nurse who's very knowledgeable about pediatric concussions and sports concussions, and she can answer questions. Uh, she can help you get in with the right kind of provider too, um, if you if you uh, don't have a pediatrician. Uh, uh, so those are really good, really good resources to have. Okay, and I'm going to open it up. I'm here. I'm I'm happy to answer any questions about concussions. If you have any questions about other injuries or other things uh, in general, I'm happy to give you any advice. Any questions? So the question is, that, again, from a coaching standpoint, it sounds like kind of what, what should we be doing. Uh, the, the most important is that the athlete's out and there's no question about them going back in. Uh, but yes, then, then as a coach, at least keep them by you so you know that they're not like losing consciousness or something really serious like that. Uh, and then we need to pass the information along to um, the parents uh, so that they know, hey, this is what happened, this is how he was acting, this is what was not quite right about him, this was my concern. Uh, and then, and then um, if the child has really severe symptoms, if the parent is concerned in any way, they can certainly be seen in an emergency room, possibly in urgent care that night, just to get the clearance to make to be certain this isn't a structural injury, like brain bleed or anything like that. Um, but they're not gonna, you know, clear for a concussion that night. But absolutely, even if they don't think it's that bad, uh, he needs to see his pediatrician. And a pediatrician is a good place to start. A person who's seen him before is fabulous. A person who can see him easily, they need to have a follow-up appointment. Um, I see a lot of the ones that have kind of been through the pediatrician maybe take a little longer, but I also see the ones that come straight, you know, this is the first visit, they come from CB or one of our doctors as well. We have uh, four CB5 primary care sports medicine doctors and children, and this is part of what we do day in and day out. Uh, but that, that would be the thing, and that, and that child doesn't come back in until somebody, I have a written clearance from a doctor saying, yep, you're ready to do 